Je sais pas. Euh, je suis pas sûr parce que ça fait un retour. Alors toi, il faudrait l'éteindre là. Voilà, je l'ai éteint. Est-ce que sur Zoom, sur le chat, si vous êtes présent, vous pouvez nous faire un signe euh, si tu mets discussion là, comme ça on pourra voir s'ils nous répondent. Il y a un retour. Bip, donc Beaulieu nous entend, donc ça doit être bon. C'est quand même pas un petit peu... Ça, je ne sais pas. Là, on n'entend plus rien, par contre. Là, parce que je ne parlais pas, mais là, tu nous entends toujours. Ok, ouais. on vous entend. Tout va bien. Merci. Bien, je crois que c'est bon. Je propose de présenter en français, puis on va passer à l'anglais. Ah non, en français. Donc, merci à tous d'être ici pour ce séminaire IAP. Donc, nous avons le plaisir de recevoir Christophe Mordassini. Christophe, il est professeur à l'Université de Berne en Suisse. Euh, tu es spécialiste des systèmes planétaires, dans le système solaire comme pour les systèmes exoplanétaires. Donc, euh, Christophe, il fait à la fois la théorie, l'observation, les liens entre les deux. Donc, euh, en développant des modèles, en les comparant aux statistiques qu'on a sur les, sur les systèmes planétaires. Donc, tu travailles beaucoup sur la crétion, la migration, toutes ces choses-là, avec le fameux, bah, les modèles de Berne qui sont très, euh, très connus, très utilisés dans la, dans la communauté. Pour ton parcours, donc, tu as fait ta thèse à Berne, puis après, tu es allé travailler à Heidelberg, puis tu es de revenu de, de retour à Berne où tu es actuellement. Tu es actuellement directeur exécutif de la division recherche spatiale et sciences planétaires dans ton institut. Tu es très impliqué dans beaucoup de programmes avec des instruments, ARPS, euh, Sphere, NIRPS, euh, Plateau, euh, Keops et beaucoup de choses. Donc, toujours le lien entre les observations et la, et, et la théorie. Et donc, aujourd'hui, tu vas nous présenter un séminaire intitulé Emergency of Four Types of, four types of Planetary System Architecture en Link to the Radius Valley. So, please. Donc, merci beaucoup pour l'invitation. C'est un grand plaisir d'être ici, et je pense que j'étais ici la dernière fois en 2017, peut-être il y a même des gens qui se souviennent, j'espère que je n'ai pas encore dit la même chose comme maintenant, sinon il n'y aurait pas eu beaucoup de progrès, non, je pense que c'est quand même bien autre chose, donc merci beaucoup pour l'invitation, et maintenant je dois aussi essayer de switcher en in English, so thanks, thanks again for the invitation. So let me uh, start. Oops, now I need to have... yeah. Okay, good. So my, this is the contents of my talk. I will first start with a short introduction. Then I will talk about the planetary population synthesis method, which is a method that we can connect observations and uh, theory. I will then talk, come to the main part, which are four types of planetary systems we find in these theoretical uh, simulations. And uh, then I will talk about the origin of the valley and fi finish by some perspectives and conclusions. So, of course, when we talk about planet formation theory, uh, there are a number of very important observation constraints which tell us how this process might work. And the first class are, of course, observation constraints that we have from the solar system for centuries, basically. And the solar system is, of course, still the benchmark system for every theoretical model of planet formation and evolution. And it also gives us unique detail constraints that we can also get only get for solar system uh, plans, probably for every. Then, of course, we have the other part, which are the exoplanets. While there are some exoplanetary systems where we know quite a lot about the, the objects, in general, for the large majority of exoplanets, we have very little knowledge about the individual system of just the mass and orbital elements, or just the radius and orbital elements. But of course, as you can already see from this plot, we have, of course, the possibility to get statistical constraint. That's something we couldn't do uh, 25 or 30 years ago. And this tells us a lot about the frequency of different planet types. You see them here, the distributions in the mass, in the distance, in the eccentricity, in the inclination, in the, in the, uh, in, in, let's say, in the multiplicity, in the radius, and so on, and all kinds of uh, correlations here. And this gives us, of course, here comes from the different techniques that each probe some palaces of the mass distance or the mass radius or period diagram. What you can see here is this huge diversity. We are all aware of that. This is different types here. Of course, at the moment, we cannot explore all parts of this diagram, but as future, as progress, techn technological progress is, we, we push more and more to the distant and also to the low mass planets. And it's clear that the satisfactory theory should explain, of course, both the aspect, both the solar system and also this diversity here in the exoplanets. Now, putting together all these constraints coming from these two points over the last, I don't know, 50 years or something, 
people have come up with this uh, sequential planet formation paradigm, quite classical here. So everything starts, of course, with star formation. Uh, then here, thanks to Alma, we have these wonderful observations of uh, the protoplanetary disk, also a very important new insight, of course, what we, what we have there. We start then from initially very small dust. This is initially the, the disks in the class zero and then class one and two which can grow to, be, to form pebbles. This goes relatively quickly, time scale of 10 to the four years maybe, and these pebbles then they can radially grow, uh, drift through the disk. So this is an insight that these things are really moving. And this form then planetesimals, probably through an instability, the streaming instability, and these planetesimals can then grow via collisional grow to form protoplanets on a time scale of maybe a million year. Some of these protoplanets go massive enough, they reach the so-called critical core mass, to accrete gas efficiently and turn into a giant planet on a maximum time scale, disk lifetime maybe 10 to the seven or a few 10 to the six years. Most of the, on this, uh, yes, this bottom up process here, this is called the core accretion uh, theory the paradigm. Uh, in this part, another important process is orbital migration, so the radial movement of these uh, protoplanets in the disk. It's not over yet, of course, when the gases is gone. We still have processes, especially for the inner system. We, we go through a series of giant impacts. There, the, these protoplanets form the planets, the terrestrial planets on time scale, maybe 10 to the eight years. And then we have a, a phase which is basically ongoing as long as the system is there, which is the one of dynamical evolution, where the system goes into a state where the, where the, the, the instability time scale is, is billions of years, so which is where it's stable over long time scales. And uh, this time, the planets, of course, individually still evolve, thermodynamic evolution, giant planets, they cool and contract, closing planets, they undergo evaporation, and terrestrial planets have all kinds of geophysical processes that are going on. So this is a little bit the classical uh, view that we typically have. Even on this sketch level, it's not so clear. For example, this is a classical view that everything protoplanets grow only via planetesimals. Now we understand that maybe protoplanets accrete a lot of pebbles directly. This is pebble accretion. And there is also a completely different theory for the formation of giant planets, which is, of course, uh, gravitational instability, very different. It's a top-down mechanism where a disk patch, a large patch of the disk becomes gravitationally unstable and forms the giant planets directly. So good. This is a little bit an overview. Now, we have seen all these different physical processes and uh, an approach to take into account all these different processes and use them to make predictions and to compare to observation. This is planetary uh, population synthesis. So what is the basic idea here? We already said that from the ALMA uh, revolution, we have now understood, although we already had in indication of that before, that also the protoplanetary disk are characterized by a large diversity. They are not all the same, we see it just uh, visually also here, and we can then try to make that a little bit more quantitative. We can try to observationally determine so very important distributions like the distribution of the disk lifetimes, the disk gas masses, initial, whatever initial exactly means. This is a little bit difficult process, uh, the initial dust masses and the disk sizes. And then, of course, when we have this diversity on the hand, one hand of the, of the protoplanets and on the same time, of the exoplanets, of course, a natural question to ask is, is this diversity of the disks as initial conditions responsible for the diversity of the planets as the end product? And we wonder if we can construct a theoretical model which links the two and reproduces what we can see in terms of the diversity of the exoplanets. And this is exactly the method, the idea of the method of population synthesis. So it starts with theoretical models for individual processes. For example, for the accretion of solids, or accretion of pebbles, orbital migration, or n-body interaction, and so on. And what we then try to do is to basically, what I like most, to make take the essence, so to distill out of it really the essence of this specific models, many of them, and put together the essence in one big model, which is called a global model or an end-to-end -end model. So what is meant with that, this is a model which can go all the way from the protoplanetary disk properties to directly predicting observable properties of whole, fully formed, mature planetary systems. This is the heart of this method. Another important ingredient is that we need initial uh, distribution, probability distribution for the initial conditions, like we saw before, of disk mass, disk size, disk lifetime, and so on. And once we have that, 
we can of course draw from this distribution. Yes, and we have this diversity here. We can draw from these initial conditions, start our model, typically takes a few months or something like that. And in the end, a finalized synthetic planetary system comes out. And then we do that maybe a thousand times, and then we get a synthetic planetary population. I mean, population synthesis is of course nothing new in astronomy. This has been done for, for many decades for other types, galaxies, and compact objects, and so on uh, in, in astronomy. What we can then also do in the next step, if we really want to do some quantitative comparison, is to apply a synthetic observation bias. So to say, what would we have observed if ARPS or whatever KOPS tests would observe the synthetic systems instead of the real ones? Because then we get the detectable synthetic population. And this one, we can then directly compare with the observed population. We can look at many different things, frequencies, orbits, masses, architecture, and so on. And in general, of course, we will find that it's not exactly the same. No wonder I mean, we have maybe not such a, we have obviously built many limits in the understanding of, of what is going on, but this is exactly the point because we can try to understand from where in our individual models, these differences come from. We go back to them, maybe they can change parameters or we have to even fully give up. Yes, please. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Typically, we have tabulated uh, from Barra or from, from Lyon tracks or whatever kind of. So, this is evolving in time, which was neglected often in the beginning in the old models. But this is something that we also now take into account. Yes, yes. So, uh, but usually, then you go back and try to understand what is going on here. Maybe you have to even give up completely. And I think at the moment, we are in the process of giving up some old paradigms because they don't seem to work. Sometimes you can also find a theoretical model which matches at least some aspects. And then this is also interesting on the observational side because we can now use this synthetic population to make some predictions. We can ask, what do I, what do at least the models predict what I would detect if my inner working angle, for example, of a direct imaging instrument is only half as large as the one before. And we can then even use that to understand what kind of instrumentation would be the best to get better observation constraints. And this gives us kind of a second feedback loop, which hopefully in the end helps us to better understand this physical process. Okay, this is a long development and in the community now over the years, or almost 20 years or so, a number of global models have been developed. This is a confusiogram here of what is now in the burn model. It has grown really a lot, but, and I don't have the time obviously to, to go into each, part, but what I can maybe tell you are a little bit some soup models. So each box basically describes one important physical process. And uh, we do the formation and the evolution. So we start at t equals zero and go to 10 giga years. And one part we always look at is then the interior structure of the planet. So we solve the classical one dimensional internal structure equation that you know, of course, from stars, it's, it's basically the same. So we look how the, this evolves in time. Then we have some models which are active while the gas disk is around. This is the radial structure of the disk, the vertical structure of the disk gives us, for example, the maximum gas accretion rate a giant planet can have. Then we have some modules which are active in what we call the formation phase. For example, there, all planets in one disk, they can interact via the end body or they can accrete planetesimals. In principle, this should not be only 100 million years, but five giga years or something like that. But I guess you know that it's very time consuming to uh, integrate systems for five giga years. So we only do at the moment the first 100 million years. And then there are some processes which then act during the rest of the time on the individual planets, which is for example, atmospheric escape or a tidal interaction with the, with the host star. And I think we can say that now this model is one of the most comprehensive models, but it has still many limitations. For example, it's planetesimal best. It doesn't take into account the early phases, pebbles. It doesn't include MHD disk winds, and the disks are not structured. And these are paradigms which are at the moment are shifting. So this is really a classical model, but I think it's still a good starting point to explore what we can do with this classical uh, aspect. So disk, I forgot to say, this is just a classical disk as alpha disk. Okay, so next most important ingredient are the Monte Carlo initial conditions. So what do we have here? First, the dust to gas ratio, the metallicity, and here we assume it's the same in the star and in the disk. Then we can use spectroscopy. Then 
you have the initial disk gas mass. Here we can results from, for example, the Van Damme survey for class one disks in Perseus gives us these disk masses. Then we have the disk lifetimes as we see them from the infrared access. What we do here, given this initial disk mass and the given a certain disk is alpha on the disk, we get lifetimes as a function of external photo evaporation rate. This is important for the lifetime. So what we do is to adjust the photo evaporation rate in the models such that the synthetic disks have a lifetime distribution, which is in agreement with the observed distribution. And one important initial conditions, or it's actually a result of this here, when you multiply this by this, you get the initial solid mass in the disks. And we find that we have solid masses in planetesimals at the beginning between about 10 to 1,000 Earth masses. And if you look at this, how many solids we have nowadays in the solar system, basically what we think, what kind of solids we have in, in the giant planets, we end up in a range of about 100 Earth masses. Maybe it was more, but that's what we have nowadays. We think it depends on the equation of state for Jupiter, for example, uh, you, you use, but um, we think we are about there. Okay. We use this, then this model, all this, uh, this framework to generate this NGPPS, a new generation planetary population synthesis, which was then published in, in a number of papers. I don't want to go into details, but you said that this can be used for. Um, for comparison, and this is also public in, in case you are interested uh, to have a look. Good. What is then, but what do we get after all? So this is uh, one of the most important results. This is our nominal population for one solar mass star. So what we see here are 1,000 host stars, 1,000 systems. In each system, we had initially 100 lunar mass, so 0.01 Earth mass embryos, which then interacted, which then grew. Here you cannot see which, which system belongs together. This is just the entire population of the host. I already said that is here one solar mass. And you see here the different planet types we get. Here we have the gas dominated planets. We have some silicate iron planets. We have here planets with volatiles, with ices. We also get some eccentric planets. And for comparison, you also have here the solar system. And I think the most important result here is that just by varying the initial conditions over a range that we think exists in nature, we get also a very large diversity similarly as observed. And we can also here see the cold Jupiters. They have to close in low mass planets. You can see that they have different composition depending on the mass. This will become important later on. They're high and here these wet ones. We have also some distant super Jupiters we have here the planetary desert. We come back to that as well. Planets in the habitable zone is, of course, also interesting. Uh, we have ice planets, but we don't have hot Jupiters here. This is something we can maybe discuss later on if you want. Okay, this is just a very qualitative what we get. But the next question is, of course, to ask, well, does it have something to do with the reality? And one thing that we are currently working on in the series is a comparison with the HARPS GTO view uh, re, uh, survey. It's already some years ago, but it's still one of the largest RV surveys, homogeneous uh, masses for uh, homogeneous surveys. So these were 822 solar like stars. And the good thing is for this survey, we uh, not only know the detection, this would be all the detection, but we also have these lines which can give us the detection probability derived from what has been observed in the survey. Because what we can now do is to apply this synthetic detection bias also to the, to the, to the, synthet, to the, to, uh, to the synthetic population. So with what you can do, uh, yes, the result there was that we had detected something like 161 planets around 102 stars, giving us a mean multiplicity of just 1.6. Now let's see what we would have found if HARPS would have observed our synthetic population. So we take the synthetic population, we zoom in, of course, to the period range that is more or less accessible. We apply the Sinai effect. Then we apply the detection bias. Oops, I was too fast. I need to restart. So this is again here. So we start this detection. We zoom in. There is the synthetic population. We put in Sinai, assuming, of course, random orientation of the planetary systems. And then we apply the detection bias. And this is what is left of the detectable synthetic planets. And this we can now compare this HARPS has, has actually observed. The red ones are the actual observations. We can first, the very first thing is just to count. 
And here we would have said, well, I think we would have been pleased because in this case, we would have detected about twice as many planets as we actually did. So this is a difference, of course. But what is interesting, if you would divide this one by this one, you get the same mean multiplicity. And the mean multiplicity, the observed mean multiplicity is a good indicator of global system architecture. So this is similar. So we can already see also that we have some similar structures. We have here a group, we have here a group, we have some voids, although they are not exactly the same. So there is some agreement here. And the mean multiplicity I already mentioned, but of course we have this, this, this difference in a factor two. And now we can start to see what it is due and it could be due too efficient. We assume that the planetary formation process is too efficient. It could also be something missed in initial conditions. This is not so, so easy to say. Another difference is that here we don't have any planets and this belief that we, we lack one important mechanism in the model, which is we have disk migration, but we don't have a quasi mechanism plus tidal circularization. And this is something we are working on to understand whether we could then also reproduce uh, this kind of planets. We can continue a little bit and make a quantitative comparison of the mass distribution. So we can take the mass distribution on one hand as it is observed in red, and the synthetic divided by a factor four so that it's, that, that nor, that it's normalized. Now we can, and we can look at it and we see, okay, we see that we have this fundamental bimodal structure of the low mass planets, less planets in between, and then we have again a maximum in the giant planets. And we see that here there is a change at around 20 Earth masses. And the theoretical explanation for that is, is that, okay, once the planet grow and around when they're here, so a core mass of around 10, the envelope mass of around 10, they start the gas runaway accretion and they move relatively quick from here to here. This gives us then this so-called uh, planetary, uh, uh, planetary desert, so less planets in between. Although this has been debated in the, in the literature. What are about the, the, the differences? So we see that the, our giant planets, the synthetic ones are more massive than the, than, the, than the observed ones. It's not a huge factor, but still. And we also see, that we have less intermediate mass planets than actually observed. And this is an indication that our prescription, our theoretical understanding, how we quickly move from here to here is too fast. Because in order to uh, remove, remain here, when we need to have the disk disappearing during that time. And if you go very quickly from here to here, this is very unlikely. So this is a constraint on our theoretical models of gas accretion telling us that, okay, we need to work on that. And the interesting result was that we had the same problem for different, for many actually different 3D hydrodynamic models which describe this gas accretion rate. So this is a constraint because if you just run such a hydro model, you cannot know what it will predict when, uh, when it's compared to observation. You need to build it, build it into a global model. And that's what we do. And there are now a number of explanations which could uh, be the reason for this discrepancy. For example, the disk could be have a very low viscosity, meaning that gap formation is more efficient. There could be magnetic recollation and so on. So this is things which are indicated by this kind of, uh, of, of, of comparison and it's also doable quantitatively. Good. This was positive. This is something what we could learn, but there are also some issues, I would say. You have seen this model. It's for those who program, it's the, the code is around 100,000 lines of code. So it's, it's a lot. And it's hard to understand because all the physical processes, they under, uh, interact. So we've already looked at this mass function, uh, the synthetic one predicted here. We have talked, okay, here we have the runaway, then you have the giants, but there is also this slope in the, in the, in the regime of the solid planets. And, Back in 2020, 21, when we first looked into all this, got these results, we, we looked at it and we could not really explain what is exactly this slope, where it is coming from. Because, okay, it comes from solid accretion, but solid accretion depends on where you are in the disk, where you are depends on the migration, the migration itself depends on the mass. So it was just, we, we couldn't really find out uh, what, what it's coming from. And that's what I want to spend now in the next uh, part of the talk is how we try to understand this and also other aspects of the fundamental outcome of this, of this synthesis. And to do that, we had to look at the temporal evolution. So up to now, we just looked at the final result at five giga years. So what you see here is for the same population as before, how it forms. So at the beginning, all planets are at 10 to the minus two, 
Earth's masses, and then you will see how they grow, how they migrate. This is the full population together, so you cannot see which planets belong into which system. But what we can see is that first we have here growth mostly in between, uh, in the inner part. Then here we have outside, outside of the ice line. Some of the planets become giant planets, other migrate all the way in. We get scattering. Now we are in the evolution phase. You see here the stellar tides removing some of the very close uh, planets. So now we have a certain insight from the theoretic, from the temporal evolution. And by looking at many of the systems, we actually found that we could find four typical types of how this temporal evolution uh, goes. And this is what we're gonna look at, look at now. And we saw that it depends on, on the initial condition and mostly on one initial condition. And this is how many solids we have in, at the beginning in the disk. And now we're gonna look at these different classes. Here we have a first class, which is what we call the class one architecture. These are low initial, relatively low amount of, 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 of solids. So what we have here is again, a mass distance diagram. This is the starting mass, we have the time. Here up here, we have the disk mass and the color code is the ice mass fraction, the planets, and this is just a track. So this should be 100 points. At the beginning, here's the ice line. Otherwise we see, okay, here we are limited by how many solids we have and outside we have less growth because this is collisional growth. So the, it depends on the Keplerian frequency and this is small when we move out. So let's, let's start, what do we see? Okay, we see that these planets grow. Sometimes you have a cross, this would be a giant impact, protoplanet, protoplanet collision. First, we have fast to grow in inside. Later on, we have more growth outside. The, 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 the transparent circles uh, are the gas, are proportion to the gas mass. But here, okay, we start to grow up. Now they start to migrate in, but oh, now the gas disk is already gone. And now we lost the damping of the eccentricities and the inclination and the whole series on the inner system and also partially the outer undergoes a series of giant impacts. And this gives us this kind of planetary system. So these are all super Earth, so Earth's mass, few Earth's mass planets inside. They are of a rocky, dry nature and outside these are of, a, of, a, of a, their ice ridge. And this is of course similar to what we think happened in the inner solar system also. The, the formation of the Earth via series of giant, giant impacts. And these are some other systems which show this kind of behavior, which show this kind of, uh, of, of, um, of, 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 of tracks, of fundamental tracks. So these are only low mass planets. There is a little bit of migration, but only little in the sense that inside we keep the rocky planets and outside we have the volatile rich planets. Typical planet masses are one to 10 Earth masses, but rather uh, on the lower side of, of this range. And then we started to understand how uh, to try to understand how can we characterize this, this, this mass here or this mass here or, or this mass here, because there is a certain uniformity within one system. Right? There's diversity among us between different systems, but in one there is a certain uniformity. And I think how we can explain that is by the so-called or what we call the Goldreich mass. I will come back to that later on, and this comes from the long-term stability and the giant impact phase. Then we, I think, can understand. You also see masses are first increasing and then decreasing. This has to do with the, with the amount of solids we have here, and then it's just because it takes too long to form these planets here. So this is a genesis, which is dominated by uh, um, local solid growth and their limited migration and giant impact. Okay, so here we can then have a look how can we derive here this mass? And this is uh, we, what we can do is basically say, okay, we can see how much mass we have in a certain annulus. And um, I don't have a watch. Uh, what, what time is it? I'd like to know. Certain. Okay, let's see. Okay, so, um, so this is what we can say. We can then ask, okay, how large is the feeding zone? We can say, okay, this is just E times I. We can then ask how large is E? And we can say, okay, this comes from the mutual, uh, um, mutual um, encounters, the maximal eccentricity we can obtain is more or less given when we have just a grazing encounter, not an impact. And this gives us then the width of the feeding zone. We can plug that in and we get then a certain mass. And this would be, if we take the average over it, would be this, this uh, mass scale here. And we see that this is a good, uh, measure for the typical mass 
we get as a t in this kind of systems. And there are some other mass cases which I, which, I, which I skip. Good, this was the first. So we have developed a certain analytical understanding why we get the masses in this class of architecture. Now let's move a little bit further. We go to more massive uh, initial conditions. So more solids at the beginning. Let's see what happens here. So at the beginning, it looks pretty similar. We have here the inner growth, which is stalled because we don't have a lot of mass inside. We have slower growth initially outside. Here, let's look also at the disk mass. Hmm? Before we saw we go up, and then they started to go a little bit in, but then the gases was gone. Here it's not different. Here we, again, we go up. We have a whole bunch here. Now they reach a certain mass, which we will discuss later on, and boom, the tracks go inward. And they take with them here these inner planets, they are pushed into the star. There are again a lot of giant impacts, and we get this kind of system. So now these are the tides. Now we get this group here, which is a bunch of a little bit more massive, very volatile rich objects. This is some other examples of this kind of, of, of architecture, and we call them the migrated subneptunes. This is again low mass planets, but now with strong orbital migration. And the masses are now typically rather on 10 Earth's mass, still they can be low. The mass is more or less flat or decreasing against the outside. And here we also had to think a little bit what gives this mass case here. And we found out that there's actually two physical processes we give, which give them. And this is the mass, this is the so-called saturation mass and the equality mass. This is the mass where the migration time scale comes the same as the growth time scale. And it's the mass where the co-rotation torque saturates. We come back to that uh, in a minute what it is. Okay, so this is the genesis here is significant type one migration, many resonant convoys and also instability. So initially they are typically resonant, but they can still fall apart later on. So this is, this is such an example. And we need to look at these tracks here, go up and then go in. So something like that. And how can we understand it? So we have something like this and something like that. And for that, we need to compare the timescales. First, the accretion timescale, which goes the, of planetesimals in this part, which scales as mass to one third. And the type one uh, migration timescale, which uh, scales in a different way with the planetary mass. So what we can uh, say is that first at low masses, the growth is faster than migration and at high masses, it's, it's faster than the growth. So we get a certain point where the two, where the two time scales are the same. And this is exactly what is happening here. So what we can do is to equalize them. And this gives us then this equality mass. And this is where they go in. So this is one way of explaining why we have this kind of masses. This is from the Lindblad torques. There are other types of torques. There are so-called corrotation torques. And they can make that sometimes you have migration traps. And this is what you see here. This is a so-called migration map. So we have distance, we have mass, and then here we have color coded the migration rate, where blue means inward migration, red means outward migration. And here, here, this is a zone where you get trapped because when you're inside, you go out and you're outside, you get in. But you see that these regions only go to a certain upper mass limit. This is this one here. So what will happen is that we go up and then we are above this mass and then we go in. And this is, this is the so-called saturation mass because this is when this positive torque, which causes this part here, this from the corrotation region, gets saturated, it gets vanishes. And this one, we can again identify, I don't want to go into details here, but we can write some analytical criteria. We compare the libration time scale with the viscous uh, time scale across the feeding zone. And then we can again derive a new mass scale. And this is basically this mass here, or here it would be this one here. And this is another mass where once you reach it, you go in. So it's these two masses which explain us the masses in this kind of system. Good. Let's move on. Even more solids, 245 force masses of, of solids. Now let's, let's look what happens. Uh, basically, it looks the same. Everything is, how, oh, however, shifted up because we have more mass, meaning we grow faster. Let's concentrate again on these planets here. But it looks similar, quite as in, in class two before. But here, we have quite a large bunch. They are also larger, more, more massive than before. And we had this track here, you see, it started to go in, but it was not really horizontally and suddenly it went up. So what happened here was that this planet was massive enough 
that it could start runaway gas accretion by migrating in. Therefore, it didn't just go horizontally in, but it went up. So this is then this class, and we call them mixed systems simply because they have low mass planets and they have giant planets. And these are three examples here. So these are these outer giants, inner low mass planets, uh, typically one to two giants, not very eccentric, also typically not a huge mass, but quite a diversity. Sometimes two, sometimes more or less same, sometimes the outer are more massive, sometimes just one. So and th th there is an inner system and there are some leftover also icy planets uh, outside. So what happens here? Here we can again look at such a case. First, it looks like before, but then here, it is not just horizontal, it's a little bit inclined. And then we, uh, we go up when we trigger gas runaway accretion. Because what, what is happening here? These are more massive planets, meaning that while they migrate inward, they can still accrete gas. So their gas accretion time scale, which is the same as the kelvin helmholtz the contraction time scale of the envelope, is shorter than the migration time scale. So they can go out of this horizontal thing and instead become a giant planet. So what we can say, in other words, that this equality mass, so this one should be bigger or comparable to the critical core mass where we can trigger gas runaway accretion. And then we get this, uh, then we get this kind uh, of system. It's a little bit difficult to write this in a closed form. Therefore, we cannot really write down an equation, a closed form equation. Good. Last kind of, of system here. What, what do we have here? Now we have even more CLS, 327 Earth masses. Let's look again, growth is very fast, large masses. Let's concentrate again on the planets outside of the, of the ice line. We have a whole bunch here. Ah, two. Whoa, one more, three. Ah, and Okay, everybody who does dynamics knows that when we have three giant planets, only a few hill spheres apart, that's not good for stability. Uh, and what you see here is that in the end, we have violent interaction. Uh, all planets are basically destroyed. Some are sent into the stars, some are ejected, and we just end up with one very massive eccentric giant planet. So this is kind of the end member. And these are different uh, uh, realizations, sometimes one, sometimes also two giant planets. So here the genesis is really several proto-giant planets, three or four formed together in close proximity, strong dynamical interaction, large eccentricity, all the smaller mass planets are, uh, are destroyed. This is actually also interesting because it produces a lot of free floating planets in, in this process here. Okay, so these are then the different, the different outcomes. And now despite all the all the thousands of lines of code, it seems possible that we can more or less, at least quantitatively, predict what kind of planetary system we, we come out, we get based on these physical processes. So we have a decision tree for planetary system architecture for our model, not for reality, but in the model at least, that's how it works like that. So first we have to ask, is migration possible? Meaning that we need to reach the equality mass before the gas this has gone. And we can express that is this condition here. If we don't reach it, it means we don't migrate much and our masses and we get the class one system where the typical mass scale, at least in the inner system, is given by the gold right mass. If we can migrate, we have to ask, do we go into gas runaway accretion? And for that, we have to compare this quantity with, with each other. If not, then we just get all the way horizontally in and we get class two, so we get, and here the mask scales is given by the equality or the saturation mass, and we get these migrated subneptions. If we can gas, tr trigger gas runaway accretion, we have to ask, do we get dynamical instabilities? And if we don't, then we can say, okay, we clear the class two, we get such a mixed system. And in the other case, we get our class four with the dynamically active giants. And I think for me personally, to, that we could develop of a certain understanding was, was, I think, one of the best things we could take out of all this population synthesis stuff. And it even allowed us, in the end, to come back to this question, which at the beginning we couldn't really understand, because we could show that the numerically obtained mass distribution we get here, at least for class one, which would be this one, can be actually well fitted with the Goldreich mass that we can calculate analytically. So we could understand where this slope is coming from, it's, it's given by this collisional uh, process, uh, which, which gives us this slope. Good. 
Now we can also ask how frequent are the different planetary system types. And we find that, okay, class one is the most frequent, then class two, class three, yeah, the mixed systems, and finally the dynamically active are the, are the least frequent. Now we can ask what, what about the solar system? The solar system is something, it's a subclass of class three, right? So inner system, inner, inner low mass planets, giant planets, and then ice planets. Maybe we can ask, okay, there should be two giant planets in order to be solar system-like, I don't know. But then we should also say, okay, there should be icy planets and inner silicate, uh, iron silicate planets terrestrial. And then we find that the frequency of such kind of system in this synthesis here is about 1%. So solar-like systems are produced automatically, but and they are rare, but they are also not 10 to the minus 10 or something. This is something I think at the, mo at the moment we cannot really tell observationally what is the frequency, but that would be a prediction. Okay, we can then again look quickly at the dependency on the initial condition. So what we have here is the initial mass in the solids, uh, like we looked at before. And here we have the final system mass. Per system, this is the sum of all the masses of the planets in one system. Huh? And what we see is that low masses, as we saw before, we get all these blue points, so this class one system is out migration. Then we get the class two systems. And then if we go to even higher masses, we get then class three and four. Here, it is nice. Ah, this could also be read as an efficiency factor huh, if you want. But here we also go above one because we include also the gas. Huh? Otherwise it would be problematic. But here we have, of course, the gas. And so these are the system which have gas giants. And what is interesting to see is that here, there is not really a clear separation between the green and the red points. And this tells us something about the chaotic nature here. So whether you get three or four, so dynamically instable uh, giants or not, has also something to do just how you exactly put in the embryos. Huh? So sometimes we seem to get an instability and sometimes not. In that sense, it's not only the initial condition. Well, where you put the embryo is, of course, also an initial condition, but not only a function of the disk uh, properties. I think that's quite interesting. So in the, in the last, uh, I'm already almost over time, let me still make a, a link to the, to the radius valley. I, I will be short. So I think the radius valley, what is it? So this is the observed period radius diagram from the California Kepler survey. So what they did, they took the Kepler host stars, they observed them, they characterized them spectroscopically. This is allowed to reduce the error on the radius. And suddenly, and this was not seen in the original Kepler data, you, you see this, it's not, it's not empty, but still, huh? there are less planets in this part here. And this is known as the so-called radius valley or the gap. And, there has been a characterization. Maybe I miss, I don't know if I have all references here. Good, okay. <laughs> so this is, uh, this, is, and this is just if you make a histogram out of it. So we have the so-called super Earths here. We have the valley. Then we have here the sub-Neptunes. And then you also have the so-called cliff. Huh? And man, many less, much less planets above about 3.5 Earth's radii. And there has been a, really a lot of interest in trying to understand what is the, the, the nature, the origin, the cause of this, this valley. And theoretical explanations, there are several. The oldest one is that we start with rocky cores, which then for the super Earth uh, lose their hydrogen helium atmosphere. And when this happens, the radius is reduced by a lot. Actually, this was predicted by some theoretical works, which is, I can say that as a theoretician, not so frequent, I would say. But this was uh, predicted, including also by population, some of our population synthesis, that there should be such a valley. This is the, this XUV driven evaporation is the, the I think also the most widely accepted uh, explanation for the, for the valley. Then there is a similar mechanism, but here the evaporation is not driven by the stellar XUV radiation, but by the core, the heat content basically in the core itself. This is also quite widely accepted. There are other ideas. For example, one is just has been postulated that there are distinct formation pathways for planets above and below the gap with those above the valley being waterworks. We come back to that because we also have that in some sense. Another one has something to do with planetesimal impacts. And finally, we had the prediction from a pebble-based accretion model that because of the different efficiency of pebble accretion, 
inside and outside of the water ice line, we should get close in uh, smaller mass rocky super Earths with a smaller radius, and we should get more massive icy sub Neptunes. So basically, predicting something or giving a reason why there could be such different formation pathways. And we will add uh, basically to this view. So we obviously looked into that with NGPPS, with original NGPPS. And I, here I need to say something. We evolve, as I said, the internal structure of this planet over billions of years. So we calculate internal structure, and there you know, we use the equation of state. And traditionally, water, because it comes from ices, icy moons, and such, has been assumed to be in a solid form, condensed form. So in ice, basically, astrophysical ices. And OK, that's what we put into our internal structure model. And this is then the synthetic period radius diagram uh, that we get at five giga years. It's the same population as we saw now, but in period uh, radius space. And this is our valley. Not good, huh? No valley. And why? Because the icy cores, uh, there are icy cores here. And they fill in the place of the valley. However, huh, as I said, water was just assumed to be in the condensed form. Hmm? And actually, there were some paper, including one hmm, who said that because of that, we can exclude that there are icy, uh, that this object has an icy composition. But okay, now we are at 0.1 AU or at 1000 Kelvin uh, equilibrium temperature. It's not in solid form. Hmm? It's in vapor, it is in a yeah. supercritical, and this leads to a strong increase of the radius. We had the so-called runaway greenhouse radius inflation effect, which was first described by Turbet. And then uh, Moussis showed that when we include that, we can actually fit this water composition, the, the sub-Neptune radii. So we took again our synthetic population, but we improved the internal structure model. So we now, took a real equation of state for the water, which includes the correct phases of, of, of water. And this is what we then get. And this is now basically the same, but with the new equation of state. And suddenly we have again a valley. So this is actually there. And even the locus is relatively, maybe the slope is too, too shallow, but at least uh, um, we seem to predict the valley very naturally. And this is if it would be unbiased. And of course, you can already guess what it is caused by, it is basically caused by these different two classes that we saw in the first part in the, in, in the talk, right? Because we have two channels with two classes which populate close in low mass planets. These are these class one systems, this little migration, which just had here this chant impact. And we have these other class two trajectories, which do something like that. And because there is this radius inflation effect, once we have a little bit of water, this increases the radius strongly. And therefore, a valley opens between the two of them. And this is what we saw. In the radius, they are well separated. In the mass, they are not that well separated because we don't have this effect that we increase the radius a lot when we have some water uh, present. So here there is a lot of overlap, although still we see the class two are a tendency to be a little bit more massive. And we can understand why, because they need to reach their quality mass, if you remember before, huh? because only then they can migrate inwards. While the other ones, they just are the gold like mass. This can be also be quite small. And what is nice to see is that the model quite very well, I would say, given that we start, you have to imagine, we really start from 100 lunar mass embryos and then just to follow over giga years, we get a radius distribution, which is in quite good agreement. And we can now split it in the synthetic. Ah, excuse me, uh, blue would be synthetic and gray would be observed. And in the synthetic, we can split it in the different planet types in the classes, if you want. So here we have the silicate iron. Here we have the water. And here we have those which contain a significant amount of hydrogen helium. We also see, OK, that this is between the water and the water edge. And this cliff here is basically given by the largest radii uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the water edge, water edge planet. OK, so I, I propose now that, OK, the, this valley is in principle a consequence of formation huh, of these different classes, different ice component, and so on. And, and, and uh, additionally to that, uh, that we get large radii once we have water. And there is indeed some observational support from that Re recently. Maybe some of you have seen this paper of Duke and Palle, where they say, oh, OK, the density for such planets around Endorphs tell us that they are really water rich. But OK, it's just a few points we don't know. But now we could think, ah, do you tell us 
that evaporation does actually not matter at all. And that's not the case. And you see it like this. Because we made a test simulation where we still have the correct water phases this is, and evaporation. And we made another one where we just switched off evaporation, just artificially switching completely off. And you see what happens now. You see all these red points up here and money, money much less green points down here without evaporation. Or if you look at uh, the radius histogram without evaporation, there is almost no super Earth's peak, but there are many more, also many more than observed uh, uh, hydrogen helium planets. And of course, something you can also study is the synthetic mass radius diagram now. Huh? Blue is synthetic and black, the small points is observation. This is with evaporation and this is without evaporation. Without evaporation, you get all this small mass, but huge planets. Huh? One or a few Earth's masses, but one Jupiter radius. That's of course not physical, but if you don't have evaporation, this happens. And this clearly tells us, no, we do need evaporation because we need to bring down all these low mass planets at, uh, with hydrogen helium to populate, to create uh, the, the super Earth peak, huh? and also to bring this in agreement with observation. So actually, yes, we do need uh, also evaporation. It is necessary to populate the super to create the super Earth peak. So it's, it's actually a hybrid origin of the, of the valley. Huh? On one hand, we need formation to bring in here yeah, these water-rich planets, but we also need evolution. We still also need evaporation to populate the super Earth, super Earth uh, planet. Okay, I just here have a summary, I think. Oh, yes, I will skip that in the interest of time. This is just to show uh, this different model, and this is now the new proposed view. What we can maybe say, and I will then finish, I think, is that if observationally it is confirmed that at least uh, some of these super-Neptunians really contain a lot of water, I would say this would be a large success of planet for predictive planet formation and, and migration theory. And it's important to stress that this is not a particularity of our own model. I see several different models. We talked about the Turini and others. They predict that also. But it could also be that we will find, no, they are all dry. But this would be also okay because it would be a very strong constraint that some of our assumptions we made at the beginning is actually not the case. And there are good candidates for that. For example, I told you about the disk structure. These are classical viscous disk structures. If we take an MHD wind disk with a strong wind, then we get a very different slope, which makes that we don't migrate all the way in. Or there could be also more, much more efficient devolatilization during the buildup of the planetary building blocks so that we wouldn't have that much water in this region. And I think this is exactly what we like to learn from this kind of observations. And I know I'm, I'm actually happy that you are here given the date. And one of the things we hope, of course, is that thanks to JWST, we're gonna be able to see if these planets really contain a lot of water in their atmosphere and not. And with that, I would like to finish and thank you for, our, for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Chance, please. In the thermal structure yes. of the atmosphere, yes. but does that still mean, or can your models tell us if there is a lot of hydrogen and helium still in the atmospheres? This is an excellent question. So at the moment, it's a little bit technical, but let, let me still explain. At the moment, the models, I think you don't see it here. Can you see it somewhere? No, it's, it's too small. Maybe let me go here. No, it's not. It's, what we find is that for the group, planets which are really close in, we get almost pure water composition. And as we go out, we get a gradient to getting more hydrogen helium. I'm a little bit not fully con uh, confident about the exact prediction, whether there is a little bit of hydrogen helium or not in the model. And let me explain you why. So we said, okay, we need to have an equation of state for water. And actually we also need one for mixtures of water and hydrogen helium. Now in the current state of the model, we can treat these mixed compositions only in the evolutionary phase, once we don't agree. This is just a model a limitation. During the formation phase, we still have the classical picture of a pure hydrogen helium atmosphere up top uh, an icy layer, a solid icy layer. 
Now, what is important actually here are also giant impacts during the formation phase. And now what we do at the moment, we try, it's 1D, right? 1D models. So what we do when we have an impact, we add the impact energy as an additional luminosity source to the structure equation, but only to the hydrogen helium part. Meaning that in a giant impact, we can lose the hydrogen helium, but we cannot lose the water. And reality, it wouldn't be like that. Therefore, we probably over predict or we under predict also some that also some hydrogen helium should still be in these planets. Okay. Hey, thank you for the beautiful talk and the beautiful work. It's very impressive. Um, so I, I want to go back to a talk I heard by Alessandro Morbidelli a couple of years ago, yes. where he was telling us, and I was very surprised, that most, and, and you said the contrary, that most of the planetary systems discovered had hot Jupiters, and therefore that the solar system was special. And then he tried to explain why we were lucky, and he used yes. resonances between Saturn and Jupiter. Yes. And um, um, do, your models, do your models have the resonances in them? And, um, and, and what do the observations really say? Yes. Okay, I think it's a good slide maybe to look at this one. So maybe I think what, what, what Alessandro Morbidelli probably said, hot Jupiters, really hot Jupiters at three day period, they are rare. They're just 0.51%. However, and that's probably what he meant, is that when we look at giant planets, extrasolar, there are a lot here. At around one AU. One AU. Okay. It's a warm hot Jupiter, if you want. Warm, uh, warm Jupiter. Jupiter, excuse mm -hmm. me. So there are, this is, this is on one hand also a little bit an observation bias mm -hmm. because, okay, you know the period of Jupiter and you need to observe but it. But he said it wasn't because he said that all, all the systems have this, almost all of them. So yes. it's not just selection because mm -hmm. he said that, 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 that all stars have been observed in some region. And uh... so it's, I think it's a fact that there are many giant planets at around uh, one AU. Mm -hmm. If there, it's not so clear if there are also some which have the giant planets further out, but let's say, yes, there are many. Now, we have a lot of planets here. And this uh, is, 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 I agree actually with what he said that, uh, the, that the solar system is in that sense special. What our model at the moment cannot do is to take into account the so-called mass and Snell group effect. This is this effect that when you have two giant planets locked in three to two or one to two, that they move outward. Mm -hmm. That's what, not what we can do because here the migration prescription is not really made to take into account a specific, specific mm -hmm. situation. So we looked into this. We looked into what kind, I, I, unfortunately I have somewhere a graph, but I don't have it here, mm -hmm. where I show solar system analogs, if you want, synthetic ones. And there, the giant planet are indeed Jupiter is at one AU and Saturn is in three to two at just a little bit outside, right? And they are at one AU. So in the model, we get something which is proto grand tack, right? Grand tack tells you you go in and you go out. <coughs> Systems which look quite alike what in the, in the, in the grand tack model is before they go. Mm. But because we cannot really self-consistently model yet the outer migration, we do not really get an exact solar system. But that's something we're working on because we would of course like to know uh, how many really solar system analogs we get. Yes. Can I ask a second question? Um, you also mentioned that um, uh, massive planets could form by a gravitational collapse from gravitational instability. So would those planets uh, migrate towards the star and then disappear or because you are able to model and reproduce very well the observed diagrams without this mechanism. Yes, that's true. Um, although, although, yes, if you just look at this part of the diagram, and we also calculated once the frequency compared to the sphere and such, is a few percent, which is as observed. However, look at the orbits of these planets. You see, these are almost exclusively very eccentric objects because by core accretion, you're still limited to formation in the inner part. You can send out giant planets out, but they are typically very eccentric, even when take into account the damping by the gas disk and such. If you now take HR 8799 or another system, they are not all eccentric, they are also multiple. But I think we can maybe explain part of this distant direct giant planets found by direct imaging 
but not if they are not very eccentric and not if they are multiple. So I think there could still be room, maybe for GI, maybe also another possibility. And this is something which I, I said quickly, I think that there are quite a number of paradigms are changing now. And one of the things are these smooth disks. And we have always assumed these relatively smooth disks. But from the observation is the rings, mm, the disks are structured. And we also see from star formation simulation that this monolithic collapse, right, a la shoe and something. Uh, if you have a full cluster simulation, it's messy. You get episodic infall from here and for there. And if the viscosity is not so high, and this is another paradigm shift, if you make a structure from the infall, it can remain. And if it remains, it will trap. And then maybe core accretion when you do it with pebbles can go out because now you have a local reservoir which doesn't drift away where you concentrate a lot of mass maybe this could actually be via core accretion a way of populating this part here so this is an open question thank you maybe a last question or last comments on zoom yes you're right are there some question on zoom Philippe Thibault, to what extent do you result do your result in particular the dependence of I have to open? So there is a question. To what extent do your result in particular the dependence of the four classes on the total mass of solid dependent on the initial distribution of embryo? Consider how much can you tune this to initial embryo distributions? Okay. I, I think there, there is two parts to, to this question. I think the initial condition distribution that all embryos are lunar mass at t equals zero is not a very good assumption. Well, it's what we could, because if you want to do it better, you have to go back, you have to go from pebbles to planetesimals and from planetesimals to embryos. And then maybe you will get another distribution of the, of the initial positions. For example, what plays a role here for the outcome of, of this mechanism is that we assume that out of side of the ice line, there are many starting embryos there at one point. This means, okay, they go together, they can interact and they could, and then maybe you get this dynamic interaction. If it would be more realistic to think that we only have one embryo there, I think we would get much less dynamic interaction. So yes, in that sense, it depends probably also on the initial placement of the embryos. What we were, uh, uh, say um, our motivation why right, to do that this way is that in oligarchic growth, we know that from the runaway growth process of the planetesimals, everywhere the oligarchs emerge with a spacing which is proportional to the Hill sphere. And this means that it's uniform in log. And this is what we assume. So there is a reason why to assume that, but it's probably too simplistic uh, as it is now. But for that, you have to go a step back and we have not done that yet. Okay, thank you. So I hope you're okay, Philippe, with the answer. Salut, Philippe, online. No other comment or questions? So, a last, last one, Gary, and we over. How does the observer, observed uh, mass uh, position diagram depend on the stellar mass? Yeah, um, so it's, it's if, you, if you go to smaller masses, basically, and temperature. basically um, the frequency of giant planets is decreasing as we go to smaller masses. The systems are also getting more compact. Uh, the planets are getting smaller inside, but more numerous. Um, although also around very low mass stars, there have been some giant planets have been uh, detected, which is difficult <laughs> to under, uh, explain at the moment. Maybe actually that could be GI, huh? because but we are not so sure. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, sure, sure. No, we have looked at it. So the general trend, you know, when you assume, of course, that the gas or the, the mass of the gases scales is the stellar mass, you automatically, you already see, right? You will get less and less class three, less class four, more class one, and in the end, you all only have class one, more or less. So, so this is the prediction. It's, it's, it's certainly, if it's quantitatively, I, I, I'm not sure, but qualitatively, it tells us what, what it gives. Actually, what is interesting is if we go in the opposite direction, because the endwarfs are pretty well explored already. If you go to the more massive stars, it's interesting. You see that the frequency of the giant plants first goes up, which is a maximum at around maybe two to three solar masses, and then goes down again at least those which we can deduct by radial velocity. And this has been interpreted that maybe, okay, the disk lifetimes are in the really massive regime are probably short 
so that we don't have the time to form giant planets anymore. But this is, I think, just uh, what we think at the moment. Ok, merci. Je vous propose d'arrêter là pour aujourd'hui. On se retrouve vendredi prochain pour le prochain séminaire IAP. Et merci encore, Christophe. Merci, merci à vous.